Would this go into the prescription-based pharmaceutical model for MDMA, or would you, because I have a little bit of concerns. So I was stuck on pharmaceutical drugs for 15 years, mm -hmm. and the interesting thing is essentially it's you're being addicted with a prescription. You're being said, you need this every day, and you believe that, and it's like, it's beyond addiction. Everyone's like, oh, you'll get addicted if you try this or that. But literally, the prescription drug model is to keep you – mm. it's a subscription model, right? Yeah. It keeps <laughs> you hooked. It doesn't heal. And my hope is that these psychotherapies and MDMA – I would worry about the stress on some of the your, your glands and your neurotransmitters with MDMA every single day. Do you think you would keep it to a therapeutic experience? Or? I so, Cody, I so appreciate your concern. <laughs> yeah, that's It's legit, and it's it has foresight. Yeah, it strains your channel a little bit. I, when If I work with MDMA, it's one of the... I mean, I have to 5-HTP. I have to take certain supplements mm -hmm. to complement it. Um, yeah, it's, 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 there's a lot to make sure it's... It, yeah, it, so it, let me reassure you. Uh, and what you said, that you know, there is a body load and a neurochemical, right. although not neurotoxic, because that no. was pro proven in the first couple of phases. Um, the um, way that MAPS will be rolling out MDMA upon approval... So MAPS is a nonprofit and they are the sole owner of a B corporation, um, MAPS Public Benefit Corporation, and that's kind of the pharmaceutical branch. So when it's approved, um, fingers crossed, it's uh, heading in that way, in which uh, I'll tell you about the research, that why I'm so confident in that. When it's approved and when it's rescheduled, then MAPS, because they've put in these 30 years and 30 million plus dollars, right. they have exclusivity rights. And so they're going to help roll out MDMA. Wow. And they are going to make it um, in conjunction with therapy. Okay. So it's, you're not going to be able to go to you know Abbott Kenny and, and pop in a shop and, and buy MDMA, at least for the next seven, eight Plus, hey, plus years. People should if they want to. I mean, <laughs> but so, so, but I just want to make sure that uh, I, I, it's done as consciously as possible. I thought that ketamine and MDMA were in the public domain. So ketamine is Schedule 3. Okay. So it can be prescribed, and it's used therapeutically off-label. Off-label just means it was studied and researched for something and approved for something and can be used prescribed for something else, which is very natural antidepressants are prescribed for depression and, right. and vice versa and many other many other drugs. So ketamine can be prescribed right now. It's, it's said to be the only legal uh, psychedelic medicine currently. MDMA is, is schedule one. And they're, and they're both very safe, non-toxic, non-addictive, right? I can speak to both separately. Ketamine has been studied for well over 50 years. It's super... Uh, the, the safety profile on it is is really great. Um, it um, is on the World Health Organization's 50 most essential medicines. It's in hospitals around the world. Yes, it's used for in veterinarian medicine. It's also used for infants, human infants. Um, it's anesthesia is its main um, use over the years. But now at sub anesthetic levels, so people aren't getting knocked out. And to your earlier point. We, when we dial in the dose, there is the capacity to create a little bit of space from one in one's experience from an internal critic, from the pain in their body, right. and get to know and learn and explore like that right, in right. these sub-anesthetic doses, again, in conjunction with therapy. So uh, you're gonna, I'm a, kind of a broken record on this, but the, it's not just the psychedelics, but the way they're being studied is in conjunction with therapy. Right. And I'd love to take a moment to kind of like talk because one of the beautiful things about these modalities is what they teach us about vitalism and the healing, how we heal. Uh, it's really interesting because ketamine is a disassociative and it seems almost our ego identities keep our trauma at, uh, blocked and stuck and trapped within our morphogenetic field. And mm -hmm. when you have that disassociation or that liberation of this ego, which it seems that from an electromagnetic standpoint, that ego is keeping these traumas fixed. So once you remove that, it allows some fluidity. And when you have a clinical therapist or a medicine person, whoever, who can perhaps either coax or help you trigger that point from that safer space, you can release it uh, and be free of it uh, instead of being under it or at least being mm -hmm. over it. You know, yeah. I would agree to all of that. And the, the releasing um, can be temporary while the medicine is active. So this is why the, the therapy piece or the, the, the integration um, is, is such a big deal. Because what will we do when we get a respite from that inner critic or these 
these tracks that we've laid down, these habits of like, oh, there's that, there's a, a some a feeling of vulnerability, and then now here comes the fear, and here, here I am doing the thing that I normally do, either attack or flee, these these things that have deep grooves. So, one way to think about it is um, with ketamine or or with MDMA, it's more about turning down the fear that we can access and, and reprocess some of that material. With ketamine, it's kind of like, uh, do you ski or ride? Snowboard, yeah. Snowboard, yeah. So it's like fresh, fresh powder. Right. Right? So even though we've had these, these, these habits in, in, literally in our, in, in, our, um, in our brains happening, ketamine can create a little bit of space. And in that space, it's like, what do we do with it? And this is big on where, what integration comes in about how do we harvest the, the call it the highlights or the, the peak moments. And then how do we do, what are the habits, the lifestyle changes that we take on to build or grow on that? An example of that, um, someone who has been very harsh with themselves, kind of took on an inner critic because they grew up in a very harsh environment mm -hmm. um, to get a little bit of respite from that as they come out of that and they feel feel the self-love, they feel self-compassion, then they are much more prone to do the work of a loving kindness or a, a self-compassion practice on right. the daily, which then reinforces that connection with themselves. Right. I love that. Super important for you to talk about integration. One of my great teachers always says, only take as much as you can integrate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also, I really love your skiing and snowboarding analogy because it actually gives us a really interesting model for the brain. I was always taught that essentially every time you have a thought, it sends plaques and proteins to the brain and you create neural canals. Mm -hmm. And if you have a traumatic thought or experience, it's 10 times the plaques and proteins. And we sort of create these very deep grooves that every time you go down the mountain, you're hitting this deep familiar groove and it's interesting like something in ayahuasca has been something a medicine like ayahuasca has been proven to dissolve those plaques and proteins so you can take new pathways what i'm finding is or at least it seems with working with these medicines they create these new sort of cuts in the powder mm -hmm. these new mm -hmm. paths mm -hmm. so even if it's for that moment i now have that path and mm -hmm. when i go back let's say if i'm working with mdma and i have an ecstatic experience uh listening to music and i dance like I dance like no one's watching. And then next thing I know for the rest of my life, I can dance to dance. And yes. I, I, and a song comes on and I'm completely uninhibited because yeah. those pathways have been, have been made in my brain and you get to take that experience back with you. It's almost like entering these states of consciousness is like stretching. You're stretching mm -hmm. into them yes. and that plasticity remains. Yeah. So even if you're using a tool and you can go here, there. So as an artist, I can create from the, all these new spaces. I can dance. I can play. I can love. I connect. I can emote. You know, I can express love. Uh, I can be vulnerable. I can be free of pain. So it's super amazing to hear you kind of walk through this. I don't know if this is aligning with sort of what no, you're finding in man, your studies. You, you are on it. And I want to highlight f for your, your audience is that um, actually even with or without any psychedelic medicine that creating a new path is challenging. Of course, it's challenging and it's harder when we're starting out. So the medicine can give us a, uh, an experience with the medicine, can give us a reference point of something that we wanna do practices. So with my private practice clients, I am often talking about habits, lifestyle. They, they start a meditation practice before we ever introduce ketamine. Um, so there's, there's the peak reference points that can happen uh, with medicine, and then there's how do we cultivate that into our life. 